What's up, 12s? It's Love the Tuba with the Seattle Seahawks, and you're watching Norb Camp. What's up, everybody? This is Norb Camp coming at you on this Tuesday. I'm excited to get back into the Coach's Corner, our show where we break down film, talking about the Seahawks, behind the scenes, the X's and O's, and kind of get hardcore and deep into the weeds uh, about this Seahawks team. And I'm excited as today's topic is about the tight ends and what we might expect to see from them in this 2021 Shane Waldron offense. So and before I bring on our special guest who is the coach of Coach's Corner. Let me just quickly remind everybody, I would really love it if you would smash that like button, hit the subscribe button over there and the notification bell. That way you won't miss a single video in the future. And want to do a quick shout out as I always like to do for the Norb Fan members, for your guys' support, the MVPs, Nick LeBeau, Jesse Duffface, Anthony D, Riker Rockstar, Lori Cross, and the All Pros, Jason E, Maria Mirage, Ninja CRK, Aiden Fam, BJ, I be Dave Jones, Gavin Murphy, and Football J. So without further ado, let's bring on the man, the myth, the legend. It is Coach Bill Marsh of Coach's Corner. Coach, it's good to see you again, man. I missed you last week. Hey, I'll, I'll take one of those three. And in baseball, what do they say? If you're betting, you know, 300, you get to make millions of bucks. So I'll take the man part. Myth, and, maybe myth too. There's, there's definitely <laughs> myths out there about me. Far from a, far from being a legend, man. But, you know, it's a, uh, yeah, I, I hate, well, you know what? I, I hate when I'm not on this show and, and hate, I don't like using the word hate when I talk, when it comes to talking about people, but I hate the times when I don't get to do the show with you, man. And it's well, just like, this is the I, highlight. It feels like Friday Night Lights when I get to do it. I get amped up for it. I get nervous. I, you know, great energy. I get vibes from you and the super chat folks and everything. So, yeah, it, I'm glad we're doing it. I, I am too. And I, I really wanted to do it last week. And it's just my schedule got so crazy. I just could not pull it off. So, we had to put off to next to this week. And fortunately, the offseason is such that it allows us to have the time to still pull this off and, and, and talk about these subjects. Quick uh, shout out to uh, the people in the chat and Devin Booker, who messaged us that we just signed a, 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 another tight end. I saw that news earlier today. Somebody off of. Uh, uh, just floating out out there. I think it was a practice what, practice squad or a, I can't remember. He came from yeah. Carolina, I believe. Uh, Nickel Bo and our moderators, uh, T Man, Boomer, Rishi, Andrew Gonzalez, Devin Booker again in there. I appreciate that. Adam Lightning has a question. Who do you think is going to start out of all the tight ends? We'll get into all that. Uh, King Foxy as well. So, uh, Coach, I'm excited about this one. You and I have talked a lot about tight ends and how important they are to the Seahawks. And I know you're you're your phrase has always been the most what underappreciated role of all of sports, I, I, underrated I, role of all yeah, of sports. About, about five years in is when I, and my mentor had, had mentioned it a few times because he would always really focus on the tight end, you know, but we, back then you only ran eight, eight to 10 plays, but we ran West coast and we ran a lot of bootlegs, but he would say like, Oh, the tight end, we got to miss rest. And after about five years as a head coach, I realized man, it, it's, it feels like it's just the most underrated, underrated position in all of sports. Because yeah. you can get so many mismatches, no matter who you play against. And Ray Lewis, as a defender, once said the same thing. He's like, teams that figure out how to utilize their tight ends are the teams I have the most trouble with. Because that, that the greatest chess match is utilizing your tight end and stuff, which we'll get into and stuff. So that's why, that's why I saved tight ends for the end of our kind of our West Coast piece here. Yeah, and I gotta say, man, the, the when you say the off season, it, as I've started watching other channels and and people who do telestrate, and there's a lot of really cool, you know, cool things that go on out there. Like, are we really even in an off season? Like I, I started to realize that even for the last, uh, probably since the Super Bowl, uh, like it just never feels like there's an off season because you can talk Seahawks football anytime. You can check out in the store now. Now they're all going back to the store again. You can check out in the store, and all the stuff sitting right in front of your face is Seahawks stuff. Even though I think it's baseball season, I think we have a baseball team here. Maybe hockey might take <laughs> over some of that, but it's just crazy, right? Like year yeah. round, there's just this constant feel of you can just broach the conversation of Seahawks football, especially if it's with another twelve, and it's like, here you go, yeah. two hours of conversation. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, well, the NFL has done a heck of a job making it so that they never really, you never really feel like the season's ever over. They're, they keep it in front of you, yeah. in you know, no matter what, whether it's off-season drama, training camps, you know, draft. And there's always something right around the corner, so you never really get a break from it. But it does feel a little bit slower right now because there's not a lot of big news coming out. But um, that's why it gives us time to break these things down. So uh, just want to remind everybody that uh, if you you haven't checked out already, make sure you check out Coach Bill Marsh's. Uh, YouTube channel, Coach for Life. He's also on Twitter. Uh, check out his content. His uh, channel is steadily growing. I know you're starting to you know, get some 
great stuff coming up here. So make sure you guys uh, check them out and subscribe as well. Um, <clears throat> before we jump into this, I, I, I do have a little special something that you don't even know what this is. But <clears throat> I, I've, I've wanted to just take a, a minute or two to talk about this past weekend I just had. Um, you would appreciate this as not only a coach, but a parent, you know, and having all those kids you've coached all these years. So my, my two girls both had big volleyball tournaments this weekend, both uh, qualifier tournaments. So Vanessa was in Spokane uh, for the Pacific Northwest qual- qualifier, and I was with Sophie in Centralia for the regionals bid tournament. Both of them had uh, opportunities to basically secure a, a bid to the Nationals in Las Vegas at the end of June. Uh, Vanessa's, I'll start with Vanessa first. So she, while we knew that it's going to be tough because we have teams from all over the country, from Texas, California, really big teams, big girls, uh, we were just hoping they'd put up a decent fight because our team is very young, undersized compared to at least a lot of the ladies out there. Uh, and they did better than, than expected. And I'm going to play a little highlight here. This hey, is hey, before, as you get ready to play Norb, yeah. I want to make sure everybody out there understands Norb, Norb knows the difference between big girl and big girl. So I don't want anybody out there saying like, is Norb calling girls fat? And is Norb? Call-? No, he's not. He's oh, like, I'm totally. Uh, like, yeah. I'm talking volleyball. And, cause, cause, yeah. Cause I've said it many times and I got daughters and granddaughters and everything. And people, Are you calling? No, I'm not. I'm just saying big, like, their team is big, like numbers wise or what have you. Not, so I'm trying to make yeah, sure they're, they're, you don't they're, get in they're trouble tall. By I should like, say tall girls. This, because saying? They're yeah. 14 year olds. Just to but, clarify it. Yes. But some of these girls are taller than me. They're six foot, they're six foot plus girls and they're only 14 years old. It's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, it uh, nice. but they, they, they brought it. So MPJ 14s, that's my daughter's team, uh, had a great, uh, great showing. And here's a few highlights of what happened in Spokane. Check it out. All right, so there you go. That's Vanessa. She's on the outside right there. Takes a swing. Bam! Hits to the corner. Off the hands. Scores a point there. Again, she swings. This time a roll shot softly just inside the defenders. There she takes another pass. Vanessa takes another hit. Boom! Into the corner again where just nobody can get to it. Oop. What happened here? Hey, why did it stop? (laughs) My video stopped. Uh, I've seen some cool, cool effects on the floor. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what happened here. I lost like, my video just suddenly stopped. Oh, okay. Wait, hold on a second. It's still going. There we go. There we go. All right, we're back to it. So, <laughs> it's a lot of Vanessa's getting kills here. Knocks it off the the hands this time. On the outside again, powers it through off the hands of the defender. One more time here. Deep. Again, no one can get to it. This is where it gets close to the end here. This is the finale. This is game point set. Boom! From the back row. Another kill. Game winner against the uh, Pac West team to get the victory in that in that game. So, uh, Vanessa's team overall, that was the highlight of the moment when she got the game winner to beat this team uh, in the final day. So they they went uh, they went they went 2 and 1 on the first day, got swept in the second day, and then uh, went 1 and 1 uh, on the last day. So, three v- uh, victories in the gold bracket open division, which is the hardest division for the 14s. Uh, finished ninth out of 20 plus teams. So, they did really well considering that I was just hoping they just win one set. They won three matches, <laughs> which was really overachieving for uh, for our team. So she did an outstanding job. So I was really proud of uh, uh, the job that she did. So And Vanessa had, I think the, the, high, the best part about that is from her stat standpoint, she had 56 kills at 147 attempts and went 66 for 66 on serves. She didn't miss a single serve. She's never done that before. It was, she was on fire. Man. So I'm very that, proud. That was awesome. Was, yeah. And I wasn't even there. I had to watch this on YouTube myself on the stream because I was in Centralia watching Sophie do her thing. So I was so excited screaming, you know, watching the video. But uh, then counter to that, this all happened at the same time. So we're watching, playing, watching, playing. So Sophie was down in Centralia trying to earn a bid to Las Vegas for her 16s team of MPJ. And they uh, needed to go nearly perfect because the teams that finished first and second would get a bid to nationals. So this is a quick summary of what happened there. Check it out. All right, it all comes down to this. Winner goes to nationals in Las Vegas. MPJ 16's national team versus the Puyallup Juniors 16's in the PSR bid tournament. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit here. 
All right, so this is game three. This is for everything. The winner of this moves on to the championship round. And there we go. So there's Vanessa, there's Sophie right there with the serve, number 12. Ahead, 10-7. Battle it out. Pialop with the swing. They pick it up. Chloe, roll shot, picked up by Pialop. Hit again by Pialop, dug up by Chloe. Take it, take it. They pop it over. Still going. Another hit. It's in the net. MPJ leaves 11-8. Another hit there. It is blocked by the middle of MPJ. 12 to 8 the lead. Again, 15 points. First and 15 wins the game. Sophie gets the pass. Set over to the hitter. It is out, but it's touched by Pialop. 13 to 9 the score. Sophie with the pass. Great dig by number one. Alina tipped over. Still going, still going. But they get the point. 13 to 10 is the lead. Partially blocked. Hustle play. Diving. Can't quite get to it. It's 13 11. A two point game. What's going to happen next? They serve it into the net. Mix it match point. One point to win the game right here. Final play right here. Pass. Set. Back row. Off the hands. Game over. Game winner. MPJ wins. Goes to the championship round. And secure a bid to Las Vegas and the Nationals at the end of June. And it was an extremely proud moment. These are the moments you live for. Courtney Schwan, the coach of the team right here. And earlier, the head coach was actually given a red card for complaining about calls, so she was kicked out of the gym. So they ran out to the parking lot to celebrate the victory with her, and it was a pretty pretty awesome, exciting moment. So, extremely emotional, very proud of the girls, and it's Sophie's first uh, championship appearance in all the years she's been playing volleyball. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty special moment. So, there you go. Coach, you know that, that feeling. We're going to the dance. <laughs> so okay, so can I can I do my first like reaction to this? Like I've yes. never done a reaction video, but man, I, I got I was like taking a few little notes. First off, the, maybe there's just never been a, a phenomenal volleyball movie, but I love when I can just hear a little semblance of remember the Titans music playing in the background <laughs> of a volleyball match. And so those of you that rewatch this, I want you to know that like many many a time I've heard uh, remember the Titans, and you'll so start to hear it. If you play music. something when I was going through your older videos, <laughs> when we did this, when I did the special show for you, there were so many times I'd find an older video of you doing something <laughs> so totally random, but the undertone music was Remember the Titans. Because it's the greatest, Classic, right? it's the greatest, if you want that it's emotional just, thrill of victory, yes. there is no better musical soundtrack than the theme from hey, Remember the Titans, man. Hey, the, that's why I let you guys put that music in like seven consecutive highlight videos, because in exchange, I kept so saying, good. can I have Kamina Burana in there and, you know, certain Duel of the Fates? <laughs> like, okay, we'll do that, but we got to Remember the Titans in. Uh I also think that, like, I didn't know they had red cards in volleyball, and I've watched tons of volleyball as an athletic director. Maybe that's kind of a new thing. Maybe it's not. I don't I've recall. never seen one. That's the first time I, I've well, ever seen it happen. So, again, because you are very involved, I got to believe that you, like, told the official and the coach before the match, hey, let's kind of like in, in the movie Hoosiers, where uh, Hackman gets kicked out on purpose so that, uh, I forget what his name is, the assistant coach can take over. You're like, hey, let's set this up. You get a red card, get kicked out. We, and if they win, they're going to run out. And I'm going to film it all. So you, you kind of create this epic moment. And they're like, we don't do red cards. <laughs> oh, oh, you're going to film it? Okay, well, I, I'm NordCam. They're like, oh, okay, you're NordCam? We'll do it. Here's the, here's the last thing, man. Thank God for your wife's genetics, right? Like I, I would always say that to, to people all the time. Like, hey, it's, here's my kid, here's my kid. I'm like, it's so great that they got your wife's genetics because that's why they're such great athletes. Norb's personality true. and your wife's genetics, perfect combination. That's why your kids are golden. <laughs> and and now, her looks the, too. The smart part, I, I know that's, I know that's, and I didn't want to say that because I didn't want you like, hey, what are you saying? Like, I don't want to go that to that route. But the smarts is probably balanced because I know you were a 4.0 in high school. She was probably like a 4.3. <laughs> uh, you know, so I know, I mean, I, you know, every time I see your kids or we do a talk, we talk, it's like piano in the background, something else. So I know we yeah. want to move on to the show, but I think, I, dude, I, yes, I do know as a parent, like you want to be proud. And I love that you showed that because so many times parents will text me, even, even today I had a parent, Hey, can I share something with you? And I'm like, why not, man? Absolutely. Like, it's okay to be proud of your kids. It's not being boastful. It's not being this or that. Like if you're proud of your kid, that's different than my kid's the superstar. And he scored 28 points as an eight year old. 
Like, okay, well, did the other team play a matchup zone against your eight-year-old? No, they didn't. So, you know, to, to me, to celebrate that type of thing is it's cool and you got a platform to do it so i say why not as long as you didn't embarrass your kids and they're like dad don't play that <laughs> i love it man you know i mean well, you know me with highlight videos I, I i can watch that stuff all all day long like i just think it's cool yeah well it was it was a great moment and you know i couldn't be there for vanessa because she was on the other side of the state but you know we were celebrating from afar and then when sophie's team managed to pull it out it was one of those moments where they played their they they came together and played their best team ball and where everybody was hustling everyone was making plays and it hadn't happened they went to spokane the week before and they didn't get a single win i mean that's how down the previous week was so when this yeah, happened it felt what, like that's what movies are made of that's, that's how the, the that greatest what, movies all so time great. right yeah so like, it was a great like that's comeback a, that's something you story. would write that's something you would write like, I, hey, I we, would. We it, lost it, it, every game the weekend before and then the next weekend they go and then and my final question though is on the nationals like how many teams is it like there's 20 teams in the bracket and 18 go to nationals like like AAU AAU basketball fifth grade AAU basketball I remember when my son made it to state like the first weekend of the season like they're holding up the sign let's take a picture we made it to state and then we get to Spokane there's like 8,432 other fifth grade teams that quote unquote made it to state right <laughs> great money making things so oh yeah uh, well that's not to take away anything because them winning everything else yeah, well, yeah. so deal. I don't know the numbers exactly, but out of the region, the the first and second place teams secure the actual bids. Now, and then from Spokane, if you place first and second in your bracket there, you also get bids. But Spokane is much harder because you're playing teams from out of the state. Um, but then they, they also created... So a few years ago, they call it the Patriot Division. They have these different, there's Open, there's National, USA, American, these different levels. And yeah, depending crazy. on where you finish, you've, you're either in the top level Open. In our case, we're in the USA because we finished second. But then you can also, if you don't qualify, you can buy your way into the Patriot Division. So you can still well, show up on, at hold Nationals. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So in the, new, in, the new England, in the New England Patriots Division, you can <laughs> buy your way in. Like, what, a, what irony is that? I know. There's a serious irony in that. I know. It is. Buy your way in. You can just pay your way in. So, you know, but but it is in that division. So you play only, so anyone who's in that Patriot division plays only other Patriot teams. So basically the the buy-in teams all play the buy-in teams. But, you know, they make money, but more kids get to play more volleyball. But there's nothing cooler about getting it and being able to earn the true bid. And that's really hard to do. So the fact that they pulled it off was a a great feat. So, all right. Okay. so, So the segue there. So here's the segue, I think. I was going to say, you kind of said it, right? As, as long as they're playing, and to me, as long as they're having fun, we've ta- we've had many offline conversations about this, right? That's what I love about Pete Carroll and what they do there. I know people get frustrated with this and that, but I would much rather watch Pete Carroll on our sidelines than watch the 98% of deadbeat coaches in the NFL over the course of time that, that are as assistants. It, it, you really see it in the NBA, and I don't – please, Super Chat, don't go all – NBA on this show, right? Like stay, stay with us. But in NBA, you see these assistant coaches like just jumping and high five. And then when they become a head coach, it's like they become this really stoic and have to kind of play the part or whatever. I love that Pete Carroll has been Pete Carroll. Like he's kind of gone reverse, like Benjamin Button. He's started off kind of the serious mode. And then when he got to USC, it's kind of like, hey, let's hang with Snoop Dogg and Will Ferrell. And then with the Seahawks, it's like swagger and bouncing and high fiving and all that. Like I like, how could you not want to come to Seattle with the 12s, with the, you know, all these other things, and then have a Pete Carroll who's taking his shirt off with DK Metcalf and brings all this energy that, because I, you know me. He was a lot like you. Something. The way you, your coaching style, you are you were a player's coach, and Pete Carroll's a player's coach. And so your style was yeah. very much like, you weren't the, the serious, you know, your mentor was more like that. But you have yeah, always definitely. been a lot more definitely. connected where you, you'll sit there and, talk with the guys and you know be friends well i think he was a player's well coach him. and i think that's as, as we look at this stuff why i think players do choose to come here uh, the misnomer behind i think players coach a little bit is that you're just mr fun guy i don't think a lot of my players or other players that co- play for other teams would say oh the a co- player's coach he's a fun guy or that guy's a fun guy but to me the player's coach can will their team to victory through motivation right and i think there were that you would admit there were many teams you see it with your daughter's team you see what they're like what can motivate that team to go? And sometimes teams need a coach to just be animated. And if you don't have that, that's just one chink in the armor that you don't offer to kids or offer the, even at the NFL level. And even though they should do it, I, that's what made Legion of Boom great. It's what makes current guys. It's why we like Adams and those other guys. It's why we love players in the past. Because there's something about a, like a Pete Carroll that when it's a tight ball game and there's a coach over there that you look to the sideline who's just like, 
we need a hero. You can do it. Da, da, da. That's way better. Looking at the guy who's folding his arms. Like, yeah. All right. Well, because even Bill Belichick, as much as people think he's just like this, you watch those mic'd up things, man. He's he does awesome a lot of talking. Sidelines. Yeah, he's awesome on the sidelines. He's now, actually sounds very he's different. Coach. He sounds really different because when you hear him on this press conference, he's like, "Well, you just didn't play well today, and you know we got to score more points than the other team." You know, but then when you when you hear him on the sidelines, you're like, "Okay, you guys got to block. You got to get underneath." The, I mean, it's like his voice is like two octaves higher, and he's got all this energy. It's actually it's it's unexpected because you're so used and to the mumbling. And he greets just guy. about every player. Uh, as we get yeah. rolling to this, what I love what I love about him, and, and I think some of them, a lot of the modern day coaches are doing this. He'll greet just about every player when they come off, and I used to love doing that when we'd score, or even if we didn't score, we turn it over. Like there's just something about when you see your leader going to greet you and high fiving you and good job or what have you. Belichick does it all the time. Carol does it all the time. I, I there's definitely a trend. Might be a, might be a show for us to do sometime. There's a lot of uh, kind of. I don't want to say unwritten rules, but trends that you see with the coaches that you'd consider to be the upper echelon of coaches, they all kind of have the same philosophical dealing with players. Like, and then you get the rare breed. I mean, even like a Phil Jackson or whoever you want to tell you, Joe Torrey in baseball, like the great coaches, they all had kind of this thing and it wasn't yelling and screaming and swearing and like, they just don't, (laughs) you know, yeah. You see it at the younger level with all these others, like, like, Hey, young coach, do you, do you see the NFL guys? going ballistic all the time and greatest coaches of all time. No, they don't. They connect with their players. Yeah. That's why I'm excited for like Gerald Everett and the guys that have signed to come on. Cause I think they've come into an atmosphere. There is culture is a big deal in sports. And I think with the pandemic, I mean, what I love about this Norm, is that we, we could just talk, like, we just talk live stuff. Yeah. The pandemic has changed. It's changed everything. Right. So it's it, in terms of, I think how they see, how we see sports, how players see sports, how players have this amplitude, even with all the stuff that Russ went through or gone through, like there's, there's an empathy there. Cause he's got to, Hey, we will, we realize how fragile we are. It's about, I want to make the most of my life and do these things. But, but I think players are also like, Hey, I want to go. I don't have to stay with the same team forever. I can go do this. I can do that. I want to go try things. I want to be different. Like I don't want to be, if you told me I was doing, going to do YouTube a year ago, Norm, I'd have said you're, you are crazy. No chance. Don't want to do it. It's not my thing. But then the pandemic made me like, I want to try everything, man. I want to try, I want to be five years old again and try everything. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely has changed everything. And, and some things we'll put back to where, you know, if we're feeling back to the sense of normalcy, you know, they're talking about training camp. We might actually get to have, we will have fans in training camp. I'm not sure the numbers, but we will have fans. And it looks like for sure we're going to have fans in the stands. Again, what percentage? We don't know, but it looks like there's going to be that return to that normal. But some things right, won't so return I, I gotta say, to normal. I got to yeah. say, man, did you see it? Because, because we're both, so my birthday is coming up. It, and I'm going to say it is a big deal to me. <laughs> like, it used to be like, oh, no, it's for everybody. Oh, no, it's my birthday. Like, don't. That is like, I'm going to be turning 50 a year from now. I'm turning, I'll be turning 49. But when I see like a Phil Mix, Mickelson, who I've never been a big mm. fan of his, I've never been a fan of his kind of how he acts on the, on the golf course, right? But I don't know him as a person. He could be the sweetest guy in the world. So I, you know, I try not to take what I see on TV too serious, right? But to see a 50-year-old dude or 51, whatever it is, win, and then Tom Brady at his age, regardless of what people think about him, to see him win, to see a guy your age, and I'm not I'm saying it in a in a cool way, right? Like you're your age, oh, yet you're yeah. still just as, as you're as hip, you're as hip as they come, right? You, you do the music videos, you do those cool things. I'm trying to stay relevant and stay hip. And, you know, hip there's grandpa. some other things. Yeah, I try to be the hippest grandpa in America, as I say. But when you start seeing those things, like it kind of makes you realize like, hey, we're all just trying to do this thing. So to, to see the when Phil Mickelson on the 18th hole, I mean, you'd have thought there was first you would have thought there wasn't a pandemic. But to see that just throng, like how badly people just want that moment, yeah. like that, that, that special choke. I mean, I was choking up watching the highlights of it. I didn't see it live. I'm like, why am I getting choked up watching Phil Mickelson win this tournament? It, it wasn't because Phil Mickelson was winning. It, it was because his age of what he was doing and that crowd behind him, like, right. wow, are we really uh, just a year later about to go back to Seahawks Stadium and just go ape s nuts, right? Like, I mean, yeah. like, can you imagine the, like these young, new players that are coming in? Like, Gerald Everett's experienced it because he's played before here in Seattle. But we've signed a few guys that maybe they've played once, and it's obviously been loud. But, dude, like the first couple teams that come to – you know, when Trevor Lawrence 
comes and plays quarterback the first time ever here. I, I don't know if he's ever been to a stadium game here, let alone what I don't care if Tim T. I, I'm a Tim Tebow fan, but whether or not he's playing or not, it doesn't matter. It's Trevor Lawrence is a quarterback rookie. He's going to experience some loud crowds, and then he's going to come experience the 12s in week, uh, I think it's nine after 10 after the bye or something like that. Dude, that's going to be nuts. Like of all the games, if I could choose one game to go to, that would actually be the game I would want to go to just to see how a rookie quarterback yeah. really experiences because you can't mimic that with turning on volume, you know, all those things. And, and people are, I'm sure in the super chat are probably like, well, what does this have to do with anything? I'll tell you what it has to do. When Russell Wilson's on the road and it's all about timing, and he's got to do check downs and he's got to do, you know, tapping his hip and these other things. Again, why do I love the West Coast offense? Because of because of the timing of things, because you can do the hand signals, because it's getting up to the line of scrimmage. I mean, I, I could hardly find any play that it looked like the Rams were running delay a game. And I know they had a few, but to watch over and over and over again, as I've been pulling up plays of, of Gerald Everett over the last you know few weeks looking at stuff like the more excited I get because it's like, geez, if Russell Wilson can be up at the line of scrimmage with 15 seconds to go on the clock, knowing how to read a defense. And I'm watching Goff have a, a year like he's had and, and taking a team to a Super Bowl, And now our guy gets to experience that. Like, I, I don't know. It's just like, I get so, I get so excited about that part of it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm it, thrilled about all that. You know, the return to the stadium, the return to, to live sports, you know, next week we go to, we're going to be gone again, going to Kansas City. And it'll be the first time, if you notice in the video, they're all still wearing masks. The volleyball players are wearing masks while they're playing. I don't know how they do it because I, yeah. it's so suffocating. But for the first time, when we go to Kansas City, they have different guidelines there. They will be maskless. Everybody will be maskless in there and because there's no requirements to do so. So it'll be the first time the girls will actually get to show their faces while they play and breathe the normal air. So uh, it'll be interesting going to a place that's different when, from the way they've handled things out you, here. You know so. whose eyes got like this big? Are you going to Kansas City? Kansas City. You know whose eyes got this big as soon as you said you're going to Kansas City? Do you know who I'm talking about today? Yes. A big fan of your show? He's, yep. Nor- Norm Kim's coming to Kansas City. Like, that that young man is probably just going nuts right yeah, now. Yeah, KC Sports, I haven't really announced it. But I just, I guess I just did. <laughs> KC just, Sports, I'm coming to KC, news, baby. Breaking news. Yeah, breaking news. so leaving on Thursday. Leaving Thursday night it's, at it's midnight. Gonna, it's going to be, it's gonna be like when weekend. I watched the Seahawks come back from Miami in 1983 with my mom at, the, at SeaTac Airport after they'd beaten <laughs> Yeah. <down> you're <laughs> going to you're gonna show up, and there's going to be like there's gonna be like seven people there with their signs. You know, maybe there's 7,000 people, but it'll be KC Sports Nerd and a bunch of other dudes wearing their Norb Cam merch. Like nor nor you know all their stuff, and it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. Oh yeah, that, that would that be something? All right, so let's 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 talk. I'm talking about excitement. Uh, you know the excitement of uh, the what's going to be this offense for next year and the tight ends. We've been talking about. I've been hyping these guys up for years, but maybe this is the year that truly the tight ends really take it to the next level. But coach, what can we expect from the tight ends under Shane Waldron and this new crew of tight ends? Yeah, so so keep me up on the screen because I'm gonna I, I want you to kind of interact on a, on a couple of these things here. So first off, the and I'm trying to be really careful as I kind of watch myself on these shows to to not get too caught up in what the past has been with regards to the West Coast office of those things. I, but I think it's just so relevant this first year going into it that it's the old you know history helps us learn what the future is going to pre, going to create. And, and if you go back to and I know Kellen Winslow of the San Diego Chargers was not in the so much West Coast offense. It was Eric Coriel and Dan Fouts and all those guys. Um, but but Kellen Winslow was really the first, and I'm talking senior the, from the 80s. <laughs> For those of you from the prehistoric era, will know who I'm talking about. He was kind of the first real true tight end that didn't always play tight end as we used to know it, where you're on the line of scrimmage. They started flexing him out, like he became this kind of wide receiver hybrid thing. And that's, that kind of started the evolution of tight ends not having to just be tight end. And then where it really, really took off was a guy by the name of Tony Gonzalez, right? He, he became the guy that really took it to another level. Like, oh man, like we have to really account for who the tight end is. He could be guy catching the ball. He could be leading the league in passing, all these other things. But here's the question I'd have for the super chat and for you, Norb. And I want you to kind of say this, stick this out loud. Tell me who the last uh, four Super Bowl participants were. Let's just start this last year. Give me the last. Oh, two. of the last four Super Bowls. Yeah, so let, let's just go last year. All right, and Super Chats. Well, stay, stay with me. I'm gonna have. So I'll be paid. Let's so work before our way even backwards. Norm, say, Tamp- say the teams. Yeah. So just to, who, Tampa who Bay, Kansas, Super Tampa Bay, Kansas City. Okay, so freeze right there, and you'll know where I'm going in just a second. Who were the tight ends in those in that Super Bowl? Uh, well, Kansas City. You got uh, Kelsey, 
And then okay. uh, you got Gronk. On the, okay, so freeze the right there. Yeah, that's it. Yep, yep. So let's go to the Super Bowl before that. Chiefs. And if you don't know it right away because we're, we're live, yeah, okay. Chiefs and Niners. And who are the tight ends in that in those two Super Bowls? Kelsey and uh, Kittle. Kittle. Okay. Pretty, good, pr- pr- that pretty good pair right there. Who played before that one? Who? Were, what was the Super Bowl before that one? Oh, what was the Super Bowl before that one? Um, is that the Rams? Still one? our division. We're still hanging. Yeah, our, Rams, our division's been doing Rams, pretty good. Rams Patriots. Who are the two tight ends in that Super Bowl? Uh, Gerald Everett and was Gronk. Yeah, Gronk. Okay. Do you recall who is in the Super Bowl just before that? In either, I'll give you either the fourth or the fifth Super Bowl back. Uh, that was Eagles who, Patriots, wasn't it? Who are the two tight ends in that Super Bowl? Uh, well, the aforementioned Gronk and uh, Zach Ertz. Okay, so let's just stop right there. Pretty damn good crew the, right the, there. The, the new the new tight end group of, of what we see today is this is this hybrid tight end group that wow all those offenses pretty much run a semblance of the West Coast offense for the most part. You know, Philly's pretty close, but they they still run something like that. But the the usage of what the tight end used to be, it, I, like I'd be willing to bet Nord within the next five years, the the name tight end will be gone. Like we won't use the name tight end anymore because people still kind of think of it like the 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 why the letter Y, because uh, you know, like when I talk about receivers, it's number one, two, three, four, five. But then there's also the letters that the West Coast offense use, which is X, A, H, B, Y, Z, and the tight end usually is the Y. Unless they're the the kind of that wing tight end. If they're the second tight end, they're the letter U. So X is the furthest receiver to the, you know, I don't want to get too much on split ends and away from the tight end to the tight end. But let's pretend like the tight ends to the right, traditionally, receiver to the left, receiver to the right. Your X would be to the left. Your Z would be the flanker or the widest out to the right off the ball. And the, the Y, the tight end is there. And then you'd have A and B in the backfield. But then the A started moving up to four receiver sets. So A was... A, kind of kept in the backfield. Let's eliminate the letter B and give that fourth receiver the letter H, <laughs> the H back. So now we had X and H and Y and Z. But then it's like, yeah, we're going to go open sets. We're not. We're still going to run West Coast offense, but with nobody in the backfield. So let's take the, the A letter out. Now we got an X and an H and a, a Y and a Z. So let's have that other guy be a U or something else. So now those second tight ends, like a Gerald Everett or something else, become the U. So that's when you start hearing offenses or if you start hearing he's the U, he's the U receiver or he's the U back or what have you, that's that second receiver, that second tight end type receiver because people are starting to, it's like in basketball when they moved away from you're the strong guard, you know, the point guard, the shooting guard and all, you know, four variations of guards and there's forwards, power forward, streaking forward, all these different things and centers. They move to the one, two, three, four, five and it always evolves. So the tight end, I think, is going to start to go away. But, man, when you start to look back at those tight ends that played in those last four Super Bowls and how important they were and how three of them are arguably the best tight ends of, of all time. I mean, you could put three of them in the – you definitely could put three in the top ten of all time. And, and Ertz still has – I mean, who knows where he's going to land. Mm-hmm. So, Gerald, so, so Everett ends up on a team where he's stuck behind someone else. So he's not the true Y. He becomes the U. That's he true. Becomes yeah. the, he, he becomes the hybrid. And Kevin right, like, Hughes mentioned that uh, Tyler Higby was technically the starter of that, so I, yeah, I didn't name absolutely. the starter, but you know, I wanted to make it Gerald Everett because you know this is a Gerald Everett. But that's on our team, and that's <laughs> and that's where I'm going with that. And that's so I, yes, Cameron Hughes is right in terms of that the the starting piece. But I wanted you to say Everett because Everett's the guy who's been the in the behind the scenes role in an offense where it somewhat balanced. I mean, he had 60 targets a year ago. Two, two years ago, he had 62 targets last year. He had 50 targets the year before that. So in terms of the balanced attack of a, of a McVay who's looking to get guys in certain spots, the difference is he, Gerald Everett, as the U, lined up in four different positions. He lined up as the, as the X-type receiver. He lined up as the Z-type receiver. He lined up as the Y tight end on the ball. He lined up in the as the U so, so the wing off the ball. So the, the receivers I'm counting is the same like kind of position, even the ones on the off the ball. So that's one. You got tight end is two, the Y, U is a three. And then he also lined up in the backfield as a running back. And it wasn't for a commercial. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get into that as well. Mm. So, All right. So what, what, when we brought in a tight end, as we're gonna show the place here, what one of the first things I love is that we brought in a guy who's incredibly versatile. 
and who I think has that kind of proverbial chip on his shoulder. Okay, so let's let's start with that. Let's start with that idea. Right. Guy who wants to play chip on the shoulder. So this Here first clip brought to you by Chef Jack Attack <laughs> says Marsh right. in the super chat. So there we go. Hey, Chef Jack Attack. Play number one to, brought to you by else. Chef Jack Attack. Check out his YouTube yeah, channel. You All right. Yeah, absolutely. That guy. Yeah, that guy's amazing with what he does and cooks. So this is a little bit more about attitude. Okay, a little bit more about attitude. And what you're going to see here is he's just down here in the slot. Uh, so, and again, if you're new to the channel, when I talk numbers from left to right, the one, the two, three is the running back in the backfield, four and five. So that it just makes it easier for us to all know who I'm talking about. So he's in the, in the four, basically talking eligible receivers. So just letting the play run. This is less about the play. I'm going to break down plays in a little bit. It's more about just watching his reaction. Now, you know who the left, and this is left corner. The left corner for the 49ers is? Is that Sherman? With the long hair? Yep. Yeah. So, it, here's just, here it is from the end zone. You may not have seen it from the first spot. I just want you to see what he does at the end of the play. Okay. Does, ball's thrown bad. Gets hit in the hip. Nah, and he just gives mm. him a little shove off. Now, I personally, I like that. Like, I, I, you know, we've been talking about how our defense needed an attitude. Our offense needs some attitude. Hey, finally, finally get to see Russ throw some attitude. I like that he's like, hey, I don't care who you are. I'm going to give you a little touch. Because then what happens two plays later? And this is in a game that was very tight. They were down seven. This is the fourth quarter. Two plays later, now he gets to line up against Richard Sherman. And, oh, man, Ooh. he beats him by eight yards, but he gets an mm. awful pass. So, again, I'm not breaking down the play. But it's more what I like about it, Norb, is that it's a guy who shows some attitude because he didn't like getting hit in the hip from that slot number four position. Now he moves to the number five position that the wide, that wide spot, he's not in the slot. And he, he did a little move to the inside. He got Richard to look inside. And I'm like, that's why I'm not breaking it down. He gives a little look to the inside. Richard bites on it. And then he goes down the sideline. You saw right there. I mean, he's open by a good. Too bad. Goff goffed it. Yeah. He, Goff needs to it. hit the blimp, which I say many times. If you ever hear me say hit the, needs to hit the blimp. Like Russ is phenomenal at hitting the blimp, meaning throw it as high as you can and let your receiver run underneath it because the receivers sometimes end up running faster than they actually think they're running. Now, the, so, that, so the pro is that you got a guy who he, he knows, and I'm going to come back to you real quick, and then we'll go to the next one. You got a guy who's got some attitude. You got a guy who's versatile. You got a guy who admittedly wants to work on blocking, but he, he works on, I mean, he, he gives great effort when it comes to blocking. Like, you can't say he's not trying to block. Some guys you can tell. He could, you can tell he's trying to block. Like, he w does very, you know, works really hard at it and admittedly wants to get better at it. Uh, the other thing I saw, I'm not going to put it on there. He scores a touchdown in Atlanta. And I don't know if you remember the, the Dirty Bird that they used to do, the dance that Jamal uh, oh, yeah. Anderson used to do. He scores and he starts doing the Dirty Bird. I'm like, you know, I, again, I, I like that. I like that he's kind of throwing it back at the fans a little bit. He's got some spunk, got some attitude because I think we need that. That's yeah. what we loved about Doug Baldwin. Like we had some of that personality trait to it, right? Yep. So the fact that he knows our, he knows the NFC West, he knows those defenses, he comes with the attitude. But now here's the here's the side that I saw that needs to be fixed, and then I'll break down a little bit more. So now let me go back to our spot here. So now this was a game against us, not last just two years ago. But I remembered uh, when I was going to pull him up, what the very first thing I went to was this because I couldn't remember if he was the guy that did this in this game. So I'm going to let this run. And again, if you're new, I usually like to just let the play happen. This late in a ball game. And Norm, now that I've been, now that you've been with me for a while, oh, you're going to know what Tedrick I'm going to talk about. Pick. Yeah, you're going to know what I'm about to say about it. Any, any idea what I'm going to, any idea what I'm going to say about this, Norb? That I saw a ton of with him? Got to circle up. Right circle there. up. Okay, so he, he did. He did the Ricardo Lockett catch at the one yard line. Yeah, he yes. We call that the tray. So you, we, if you're new to the game, if you're new, we talk all the time about circle up. And then now I'm gonna I'm gonna start breaking stuff down. So I'll come back to you real quick. We talk about circling up. Like the number one thing as a wide receiver, you have to circle up, create the claws, extend the arms, because you can see the tip of the football. Every receiver's taught this from youth to all the way up. But there's some there's like a natural tendency to want to turn your arms the opposite direction. It just feels natural or what have you. But as soon as you do the tray of inopportunity versus the circle of opportunity, and that it's just a term that I've used for for years, the circle circle up, because you can yell that out to a player, and it's not like you need to catch the ball. Yeah, no kidding, coach. No, you need to circle up. Oh, that tells the receiver they did this. What I loved about it though is that after he misses it. 
like he knows right away. Like watch his reaction. Oh man! Like, yeah, and he didn't even know his like pick he, yet. <laughs> yeah, he didn't know his pick, and they ended up reversing the stuff. You know, they called it incomplete, and then in a challenge flag, we got it, and we ended up winning that game, close ball game. That was two years ago. Yep. Then this last year, though, and this is why it's hard to you know pick five plays when I could show a bunch. I would say eighty to ninety percent of his catches circled up, hmm. and I mean like like caught the ball arms away from his body high point catch like you like i have a feeling that that really got to him that he looked at that and said man i blew this for my team now he didn't blow the game but that was the second to last drive they don't get it on fourth down the final drive they you know they don't score we win the game so to me it's like when you can see a player that maybe has a learning point moment i think that was a big learning point moment for him and the fact that the guy is played at junior college then he went to uh, alabama birmingham the year that they shut down the program then he transfers to, uh, I think, Southern Alabama. So he goes to the three colleges, plays in those three offenses, and then he's still a second-round draft pick after becoming a, after he's a two-time All-League, All-Conference player. Like, there's just a lot of things I really like about this, this kid. Like, really, really like about him. All right. So let's look at, let's look at some actual breakdown of some stuff. Uh, actual, Same let's game. Yeah. No, oh, uh, there you go. That. Let's give him that one. Let's give him that one. All right. So now – this is, this is a loop around, and there's lots of different terms for it, so I'm not going to get really technical. However, one of the, one of the things I've been uh, talking about doing with somebody, not I am going to do it in June, it's coming up in June, is there will be a football 501 course every Saturday morning. So it's, you won't find it under football 101. It's going to be football 501. So it's just going to be a live, live show. You come on, we talk about stuff. I'll tell it straight. I'll answer questions. Ton of fun. So that's why I don't give a lot of basic stuff when you and I are doing this, because I think the 12s, I've said it before, the 12s are more knowledgeable. So this is a loop around. What I like about it, after I'm going to let you watch the play, is what he does. Now, perfect example of what I just spoke about. Where we, and again, it's not like every time he circles up. Like No, no player circles up every time. You, know, it, you can't always do it. There's times where it doesn't work. But there's times where you definitely have to do it. And it's just nice when it's a smooth, fluid catch. First off, he's playing, you know, in a different, he's playing in that U position. He's in the opposite spot. Guys are obviously jamming as they come off the line of scrimmage. And now he has to run this, this loop around. And what most receivers will do, especially in that U position, if they've got to end up here, they'll try to fight their way through. And he's essentially being double teamed. I mean, he's got, he's got a guy who's getting here. He's got a guy who's getting him on the outside. He has to loop around. Now, where Goff actually does a good job, and you've brought it up before in terms of, gosh, why does he, you know, get so many yards against us? Goff knows how to get the ball out of his hands because he's been drilled millions of times, not hit drilled, but like get the ball, get it out of your hands. Even if the receiver isn't there already, the key to the West coast offense is trusting that your receivers are going to be there all the way back to Jerry Rice. Montana figured it out. Steve Young didn't figure it out and he had to get yanked from the game. And Walsh had to say, Hey, look, just trust your footwork and throw it. And they will be there. You don't need to see him because Young's like, I can't see him. I can't see him. Goff sometimes messes up because he doesn't see him. But here you'll see as he loops around, it's almost like a Texas route. And we've talked about the Texas say, route. Yeah, yeah. To, you, you, you're going to the running back is the tight end, yeah. But what you're really looking for is the snap of the head. Like when a receiver turns, and it's like, boom. Because your, your head is always the first. If your head is the first thing, it turns your shoulders, it gets your body turned, everything goes with it. And sometimes we say like snap the head in the hands if it's a really quick one. But I love the, the route, how he runs this route. Because you could tell from 2017 when he first came in to now, like his route running has improved. And you don't see a lot of improvement with a lot of receivers. Like, what, what are we hoping that DK can do? Improve his route running. What Amongst did uh, Baldwin? Yeah. 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 And what did Baldwin like say that he worked on? Like, he worked so hard on his route running that he became one of the best route runners in, you know, one of the best get off guys, one of the best route runners. So, this is where you don't look at a guy as a traditional tight end because traditional tight ends don't run these type of routes. But man, he runs the curl, run or the loop. Sorry, because not a curl. If you say people say a curl, the curl is straight ahead, turning, coming back to there. It's more of that Texas, but it's this looping route. The part of the West Coast offense is this little triangle. It's finding the windows and not waiting for him to clear the windows, but just throw it now. Boom. Hits it right through that. There's the double triangle that's there. Big window of opportunity. And then one of the best things about him, Norb, is that he catches the ball and the, the yak with him. YAC, yards after catch. He turns and loves to just get up field. So many times he would cut back into guys instead of running out of bounds. And, and I love that. 
Like I love that out of a dude because that to me is the tight end mentality you want out of a guy, right? Catch it, get up the field, do his thing, but just great balance, good stuff. And again, you, you could find 10 other dudes and go, hey, look, he's an NFL player. He should be able to loop around, should be able to spin, land on his feet. They don't. Like, like they don't. Gronk does, a Kittle does, those guys, they, they have, there's something, something special they have with their balance, the athleticism. I just don't think he's had a chance to really show it because of, you know, the, the offense he's in and the fact that he had another tight end that was there and he's balanced. But now he gets to be the primary guy. So, and I'll come to it at the end. I'll talk about uh, kind of that number one, number two, number three receiver thing we've talked about, because I think when people are saying, well, who's our number three good receiver going to be? I think we're looking at him. <laughs> I think we're looking at him, but we're getting caught up in three true receivers and a tight end versus saying, hey, this is really one of the wide receivers. He's just t- called the tight end. Versatility. Now, this should get you. The, the reason I pulled this play, multiple reasons. One, uh, actually, I'll let, let you watch it first. A little jet sweep action. Oh, Norm, I love it, man. So you're gonna be in you're gonna be in the 700 class here pretty soon. Like you're definitely jumping up up the way. But but what there's multiple things I love about it. But the thing I love the most about it is it's at the three yard line. You can be power running it in. They're in a they're definitely in a jumbo type setup because you got a tight end over here, you got a tight end over here, and then you've got him playing the He's playing the U spot, but he's the he's the number five receiver technically because it'd be one, two, you know, three, four, and five. But they run the jet sweep. I would think that it's a commercial. Like if I'm watching this on TV, just live regular, the moment he goes in motion, I'm like, okay, jet sweep fake. They're gonna fake it to him, still run the, the dive of the lead or run a play action. No, man, they like this tells you that he's got decent enough speed. He knows how to bubble out, which is part of the jet sweep motion stuff in the hybrid West coast is getting the ball and not running straight in the line, but you get it and you immediately bubble out. So that allows timing to get the blockers. So the defensive end can't get to you and allows everybody to get the crack backs. And then you determine whether you're making the hard cut back or not. So as he comes and gets the ball here, boom, he's out bubbled out. And now he just gets to outrun it to the end zone. Some great blocking uh, up front too. Great blocking up front. But, but to me, you're not asking, you're not asking your team to do a lot. But if we're keeping it focused on like, what do we expect from the tight ends? Again, we talked about, I heard you breaking up the other night. I don't recall what show you were doing. It might have been Madden or something, but it was, uh, you know, how many times on third and short have we seen three receivers go 15 yards down the field and <laughs> Russ is bouncing around looking for it and then he's scrambling and then he, we throw it deep and it's like, it was third and four. Like, why aren't right. we just doing Get this five. or doing that, right? Yeah, just, just have three or four receivers do that. Or here on the goal line, when they've got, you know, they're running basically goal line nine here. They got everybody up on the line of scrimmage and, the, you know, a single high linebacker who's just going to spy the running back and try to just beat them at the point of attack. No, man, like they, this is where we hope that there's been a little bit of the McVay rub off onto Waldron, right? Like, will Waldron have the confidence to run this? And the fact that Gerald Everett signed here when he could have signed anywhere as a free agent, that speaks a lot to Waldron was his tight end coach when he first came into the league, that he definitely feels like, hey, he, the passing game coordinator was important, that he, he did have say in what's going on. Because if Waldron didn't have say in what was going on in the passing game, there's no way Everett comes here. I, I don't think he'd come here at all. I don't think there'd be a chance. And the fact he's like, hey, this guy runs, these, he always, he's willing to run these little mini trick plays. This, like I said before, this to me is the, the new trick play for the NFL. You're not going to see many halfback passes. It's jet sweeps. It's mixing things up. It's calling what the other team doesn't expect you to call. Because you can see who's chasing him down. I mean, it's one-on-one with the DB. This DB is locked one-on-one. As soon as he goes jet motion, they don't switch. This guy's two yards behind him. He's caught up in the wash. Hey, our offensive line can do that. Right? They can get two yards. So You know what I like about right. that? You can well, I just, you don't see if I end yeah, yeah, you. But yeah, yeah, what's, yeah, yeah, what's, yeah. yeah. What's kind of funny is the uh, the the play fake is so good that the uh, the tackle still tries to tackle the running back even after he's given the ball here, number ninety seven. So, he goes and makes the tackle or tries to make the tackle on the running back even the ball is long gone around the corner. Yeah, and you're gonna you're gonna see that. I'm glad you brought that up because you know I think Russell's gonna be awesome with that because he actually does a really really good job with play in my in my opinion he does a great job of the old Boomer Esiason, really play only fake. Boomer Esiason and Peyton Manning are really the only two quarterbacks who go for the far hip pocket fake, meaning a lot of quarterbacks will stick it out there, but it's, you know, for the end zone, it's good enough, 
But man, Boomer Esiason back in the you know, late 80s, early 90s, I mean, he would stick that ball across the running back's body and then last second pull it out. And Peyton Manning would do the same thing where it, it looked like he was reaching to the far hip pocket, which is where you uh, teach a quarterback to hand the ball off. That way the running back's running forward. That ball slides right into their belly. Most quarterbacks kind of come short. Goff does a pretty darn good job most of the time of doing that. And, and we, that's why I always say you're the cowboy when you walk up to the line of scrimmage, but you're the magician when you turn around. Always would tell our quarterbacks that. Hey, you're the cowboy. Got to be calm. Got to be relaxed. But when you turn around and do bootlegs or play action or anything else, you're a magician. Whether you hide the ball in your stomach, whether you put the ball in your hand, whatever it is, man, make it look like it's got to look the same as when you do hand the football off. That's why guys try to get the ball as close as they can. And Russ does a good job because right out of the center, he's usually reaching right away, but he does that on actual running plays too. That's the key is making sure you're making it look the same. So like you said, from here, like that, that fake right there is tough. But from the side, guys are biting, but you can tell these two can definitely tell that he's got the ball. So there's, there's stuff you can still work on here, even though you froze these two guys. The yeah. linebacker's chasing, but linebacker has no chance at it. So I, I love the play, but I love that he's doing it. And this, to me, is why 40 times again are overrated. That's it's why they're getting rid of it, I think, because he, he's a 4 6 40 guy, which is not slow. <laughs> In my opinion, 4 6 is not slow. But by NFL standards, it'd be like, well, he it can't sounds, call a wide receiver. It sounds slow, yeah. yeah but it's, yeah. And he, he, redid, he redid like his shuttle and his broad jump because he didn't think he did well at the combine. So he did him again at his college day. And it's like, I mean, those are more for strength. It's not because I love when people say, well, when are you ever going to do the broad jump in the NFL? Well, you're not. <laughs> you know, just like you're not going <laughs> right. to bench, you're not going to bench press in the middle of the game either. But they, they want to <laughs> test those things. But do you understand angles? Do you understand the concept out of block? Do you circle it like, you can be a 4 2 40 guy. If you do the trade of an opportunity, you're still going to drop the ball, right? So mm-hmm. it, it's how do you maximize this type of stuff? All right. Uh, we're going to go one more and then we'll take a little, okay. take a little break. And then there's only. Yeah, a, we will. If you guys want to call in with questions, uh, jump in on the Discord. I have it pinned at the top, or maybe I don't have it pinned, but you can go to the uh, link in the description and uh, I will pin, pin, the, uh, pin it right here so you guys can jump in at Discord and do a live call in questions for Coach Marsh. Now, I've said uh, many, many times that it, angles is the number one thing in football. It, it really is the su- number one thing in all the sports. You got you to understand angles. But vision, vision is, I would say, arguably number two. Like, you have to have vision to understand. And by vision, I mean not 2020 vision, but like, do you see what's, hap- do you see what's happening in terms of having a feel? Like we used to say, you, you see with your ears, you hear with your eyes. There's all these little sayings you see as coaches that get, you know, kind of get kids to understand in a kind of funny, funky way. He, he's got vision and he understands where to be in space. We talked about it most when we were doing the KJ Wright uh, show a while back, how he has such great vision that, you know, overtakes and compensates for maybe some deficiencies that people might think that he has. So same thing here. I'm just gonna let the play run, but you'll see some, uh, some illustration on this. And where's Everett here? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you see it. Oh, coming, you're see, okay, all right, we'll just watch it. You're, you're, you're going to see it happening. All right, so as he's getting ready to run the play, uh, now I'm going to put the pause on because there's a lot of stuff happening here, everybody. <laughs> so here's how, here's how I do these telestrations. Orange represents something that's connected to the guy I'm talking about. Yellow is kind of everything else. Yellow is post-play. So all the things you see in yellow is what happens after the snap, the routes, the, the play action running, but the orange represents the guy I'm talking about or someone who's connected to the guy I'm talking about, in this case, Jared Goff. So the orange for Goff over here is his bootleg. But here, what I really want you to see is, first off, he's blocking. It's a play fake. It's a bootleg. So the bootleg action, all the linemen are going to move to the left. And traditional bootleg, which I've talked about with the tic-tac-toe patterns, and I'll definitely break those down in my football 501 because we're going to see a boatload of bootlegs. But the concept is you're trying to get levels. They they call it the, the level concept where you're getting a guy at five yards, a guy at 15 yards, a guy at 25 yards. It doesn't matter how you do it. It doesn't matter what formation you do it in. You can do it from every formation, anytime, anywhere on the field, but you're trying to, not anywhere on the field, usually you want to be at least 25 yards from the goal line, but you're trying to get five yards, 15 yards, and 25 yards. And then a guy on the backside who's running, uh, we used to call it the gold bullet, but you don't throw that unless you tell him to do that. Here, the gold, the secret guy might be this running back, but the, Bootleg as it comes around, the key is the tight end who on this this specific play is not necessarily involved because he's not the true tight end. So he's just he's just meant to block, but he is an eligible receiver. 
where the true receivers are coming from is this number two guy who's going to end up going behind the play and going out over here, the number one receiver who's going to run the drag route across the field, and then this true tight end, the, the letter Y tight end, who's running this deep post route, I mean the deep corner route. So as they start to get ready to go, I still want you to just focus on what he's doing when he blocks, 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 blocks. Now, the key right there is he's, his job is to block so well that this guy who would have contain on the quarterback, so this linebacker right here, has, is, it's one of the toughest things to do. This is why I say the tight end is the most underrated position because first off, you got their true tight end who's running a corner route. I mean, he's going to run this guy off, so that's going to draw guys, and he's a big dude, but he's going to draw the, the quicker guys out of there. Their other tight end, who instead of being back like a wing, is really pushing, being up tight, almost making this guy ineligible. If he blocks this guy well enough, it allows Goff to get out and around. So as he gets ready to, as he's making his block, let me move forward a little bit. As he's getting the block here, what you start to see is, oh, 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 sorry, my fault. Right there. Great block. Okay, you could say it's holding, maybe, maybe not. But he's got him sealed off well enough that, that look at Goff when he comes around. Plenty of space here. It's going to allow everybody to move. But instead of him just sitting there and being done with the block, once because you can't block forever. Eventually, the guy's going to get off. But he's done his first job. His first job is block so well that guys think that it's a running play. Well, we did this with a, a Buffalo Bills play a while back. The running play, you want to get at least half of the team on the defense to go to that running play if everybody does their job. Well, look at all these linemen that, first of all, look like they're getting ready to go to a King's Buffet for a meal because well, they've done their job for two seconds. Now they're standing there like, hey, let's just stand around. Like I, Even as a high school coach, I say, guys, let's after he throws it, let's get ready to run. Like You can't go past the line of scrimmage, but if, if they throw something short, let's get ready to run down there so we're ready to go. Yeah, we're going to get ready for a Python contest. So they're hanging out, but they don't have to do anything anyway. Here's, here's what I like. As the play goes, he's coming around. They're getting into their levels. But now Everett, he's got to get to a spot. Notice how he did these little baby steps, but now he's creating the vision. He's got the vision of, I need to create space so that I can get the ball on a play that is definitely not designed for him to get the ball. So it's little things like that where you've got guys running levels over here. These are the three guys trying to get the ball. Boom, boom, boom. These three guys, five yards. He's going to go to 15. He's going to go there. This is a setup for the future of, hey, if I just sit here, this running back eventually will go down the sideline. Teams do it once or twice a year where they just wait to see if they don't pay attention anymore. But it's this guy right here that a lot of guys would just be done. But he finds the space, creates the vision so that he can see that there's a he's just going to stay in that spot and it's just enough for Goff to make an easy pass. And as we always say, hey, quarterbacks, throw it five and let your receiver get more yards. Now, he coughs at the ball. It happens, but I, I love I love what he did. I really love what he did there. So uh, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna do one last thing, okay. and then we'll and then we'll take the break on this. All right, because this play. is more of a versatile piece, and this is a quick one. Just again, the versatility of as you see the play take place. Now he's lined up with the number one in a spread receiver set, five receivers, quick hit, and this is what I, again what I love it. I don't care if you're four six or four two. There's your dirty bird. Boom, they're in the dirty bird, like a little bit of attitude. <laughs> but again, if you just said right when we got him, hey, we got a tight end from the Rams, Gerald Everett, well, draw where he lines up. How many people are going to line him up yeah, in a true tight end position? Everybody left. is. Right. Everybody's going to line up the name and the tight end in the true tight end position. But that really no longer exists in this, in this hybrid offense. You have to think of him. Now, I'm not saying that he's Kittle. I'm not saying that he's Gronk. I'm not saying he's those things. But the position they're gonna, that I think that they're going to play him is he becomes the chess match guy. Everybody knows what Metcalf does. Everybody knows what Lockett does. They know what Carson's going to do. They know that Wilson's going to do his thing. It's how does Waldron use Everett as that secret chess player of, man, every play, we don't know where he's going to go. And when teams talk about 12 personnel, you know, how many running backs and tight ends you have, well, what are you going to consider him to be? Is, is he is he one of, and I'll get to the running back stuff when we come back from the break, but where are you, who are you going to put against him coming out of the huddle? Because you don't know if he's coming out of the huddle to be the tight end. Is he coming out to be the receiver? And now your defense is based on, do you have a nickel, like an extra defensive back? Do you see him as, hey, we, we got to have two extra defensive backs? 
do you see him as well? I think we just, he's a tight end. So let's keep our linebacking crew in there. Like to me, I think that it's one of the best free agent acquisitions we've picked up in the last two years. Again, free agent, not trade because Adams was a trade. I think he has potential to be a, just an outstanding, outstanding pickup for us. If we utilize him the way I think that we'll utilize him. Because again, here you go inside the eight yard line. This is what I hope Waldron does. Don't be, pre- we're, I hope we're not predictable. First down run, second down play action, third down run. Like that's kind of what we usually do. Something similar to that. No, they go quick hitter. They get their lineman out in action. And I tell you what, if you're a lineman who's a little upset at good old Russ, you know what you're doing? You're like, hey, as we're getting the ball out of Russ's hand, like they're still going to block because they got to make their money. <laughs> they don't, they don't want to get cut. They don't want to lose their jobs. But I'll guarantee you, they like linemen like this type of stuff because it's a pass, but it's not pass pro. Right. Watch what these linemen do. Watch these linemen, man. They are out of three linemen. It is a series of Mack trucks and every mm-hmm. one of them gets the block. So, so you're just, you're doing a lot of things. So when people were upset about, Hey, what's Carol and Schneider doing all that stuff, man, those guys, I think they, I think they nailed it again when it came to this, right? Get, get the right player, get the spot. How many times did we see Russ and th- and this isn't Russ's fault. So I, I want to make sure that you're aware that everybody understands. I'm not saying it's Russ's fault that he's holding the ball all the time. Sometimes. Yeah. But look how quick Go- Goff does not even try to find the laces. Yeah. And it's a famous drill that Peyton Manning used to run all the time where he would, he would start his practice by running a drill where a guy would would throw a ball, ball, ball over and over and over, like literally half a second, half a second. He'd do 40 or 50 of those and he'd grab it and he'd have to throw it to whoever put their hand up, but he couldn't find the lace. He wasn't allowed to find the laces. Like it was his own drill that he created. What was even crazier is that he would then have, he had that film and he would watch that. That'd be the first thing he'd break down after every practice it would be hit that drill of him grabbing the ball and trying to get it out as quick as he can. And that's why he's said like, Hey, I don't have the perfect spiral because I learned how to get the ball out of my hands as quickly as possible. And still how to, it's about getting it from a to B. It's not throwing the perfect spiral. Like your dad told you what, you know, when you were five years old, we all had that right. Dad teaching you how to throw the spiral. It's like, geez, that's great dad. But I missed my receiver by 30 yards. And now I have to play left tackle in high school instead of quarterback. So, I yeah. had a mom who broke her thumb. My mom broke her thumb teaching me so that I, I did get to play some quarterback in high school uh, because of that. So oh, way to go. Yeah, so, so, so I'm excited for two, uh, two, the other two plays. I think you'll see some really cool, even more reasons to get excited. And that's what I'm trying to do here with you, Norb, is get, get the 12s excited for what we have. Yes, there's some cons to this game, just like everybody else. But man, like, it is the off season. We should just be full of excitement, hope. We're a 12 and 4 team that I think has become better with the acquisitions that we have. I love it. I love it. That's great breakdowns. Well, let's just take a moment to take some uh, calls if we have any here. I think we at least got one here in Discord. It's uh, one of my most uh, prolific coach coaches on my Madden simulations. It's Seahawks for life. Seahawks for life. You there? Yeah, I'm here. All right. Uh, uh, on schedule and on time as usual, man. So uh, welcome to the show. Uh, what you got? What's on your mind? Nope. You there? Still First with of us? all, you're looking good. Uh, oh, Norb. Okay. Thank oh. you. He's talking to you, Norb. I'm I was here. just going to say, he's obviously talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> um... Anyway, when you were a um, a high school football coach, did you ever did you ever want a a a tight end who kind of played like a wide receiver, kind of like Gerald Everett, or somebody who could block who can block, which is kind of like kind of like Walt Disley. Hmm. Uh, so the easiest way to answer, and I try to be really careful with my background stuff because it's it's fun and it's fun to talk about right but it's a just question so i was very lucky because of the way i thought of the tight end and the way i wanted to utilize him and because of how we had run it even before i took over uh when i was just when i was the head coach we had the all league tight end nine of the 10 years uh that i was head coach in my first spot nine of the 10 years to have the all league tight end they had to catch the ball quite a bit we did that because we moved them around. I would always try to find a, it's usually a guy off the basketball court. And that's, and I saw that because it was, you know, Tony Gonzalez and even guys before that, they were basketball studs that 
would come out and play. So I was always trying to find, you know, who's a, who's a six, two or six, three dude that can run decently that if they come out and I say, hey, look, you're, you're going to have to block, you're going to have to do some things, but I'm not going to make you a lineman, but I'll, I'll line you up. And when we get inside the 10 yard line, I'll flex you out and we'll, and that's what was the term always back then was, Hey, you're running flex. You're going to flex out, you know, 10 yards wider than the tackle, what have you. And we'll do some, we'll, we'll lob the ball to you, what have you. So, yeah, I, I always tried to make sure I had two, you know, two tight ends all the time that could catch that they had to be able to catch the ball. They had to be able to run. And we just found the mismatch. It was the very first thing that we would always look for when we were scouting other teams was how, how can we find the mismatch with our tight end? Um, you know, can we put him in the, the middle of a trips receiver set and have him over a safety that's smaller than him? Could he line up as a true tight end and go against the linebacker that's maybe bigger but slower than him? You know, no matter where we put our tight end, it was really, can our O-line block well enough for our quarterback to throw the ball? And can our quarterback get it to the tight end? But it wasn't from a lack of having, you know, we, we always try to put arguably our best athlete in that tight end spot. In, unless they were, you know, a true running back or whatever, then they put running back and catch the ball at the backfield. But yeah, I, I loved, loved having tight ends that could move around and be very, very athletic. Because you don't have to block very long. I mean, you really don't. But if you got courage, like ever, like ever does like block for a second you watch gronk there's a great clip of gronk blocking a guy who'd been chirping at him you know gronk talks a lot of smack but this guy's chirping at him chirping at him chirping at him and finally gronk just blocks this guy into the end zone turns left blocks him all the way out of the sideline five yards out of bounds takes him down and he comes back and the interview after the game's like i just i had to kick him out of the bar like he was a bouncer like that's what he says. Like, I had to kick. I had to kick the guy out of the bar. So you want that guy who's got that mentality of I'll block. I'll block hard for you, but reward me by throwing me the ball. Oh, that's good stuff. That's a good question. Good question uh, regarding uh, the old strategies back in high school. Um, you got a follow up uh, over there before we continue on to our um, next one. Our next I, segment. I do. Okay, I figured you do because um, you usually always have a follow up <laughs> question. What you got? Um. So I know Russell Wilson um, ha has kind of not liked the uh, protection. So do you think if we use the tight end as more of a block, as a blocking tight end, do you think we'll have less sacks in this year from here than from, than last year? So, so to just give a very straight answer, I think the the less sacks has nothing to do with the with the tight end specifically to your question. Of course, it has something to do with the offensive line blocking, but I think it has everything to do with Russell's willingness to accept the timing of what the West Coast offense does, the, the footwork of the three-step, the five-step, the bootleg, the getting it out of your hands quickly, you know, all those type of things. I, I think we can eliminate so much of that, so much of that, and it's going to keep him in great shape. Like, he doesn't have to physically be scrambling all over the game, all over the place. He can just... He can still be the great athlete, but do it in the confines of bootlegs and sprint outs and those type of things. They'll use it. They'll definitely put him in there. And I think that's why we're picking up some other tight ends and do those things. But I think I'd actually rather see us play the four and five receiver sets because that's really where the NFL is going. It's where it's been for a while because teams are playing with seven, eight, nine DBs now. I mean, there's a game against the, the game that Russell threw the interception last year against uh, Arizona. In fact, I was talking with Nick LeBeau about this uh, yesterday or two days ago, the first time in Russell's career that he's ever seen 11 dudes standing up. The first time I'd seen it in 27 years, 28 years of coaching at any level where 11 guys were standing up. It's because uh, Vance Johnson, the DB or the defensive coordinator for Arizona, realized he wanted to do something different. So that pick, that pick in the overtime was 11 guys, none of them in a three-point stance, and only three guys rushed, but Russ almost threw it too quick, and then we got the pick because it was more of a kind of a read and react. So that's why I think if he can just really, really grasp this offense, because he's so smart and we got the athletes, I think we can cut it down by easily 40 to 50%. Because you're still going to get sacks, right? He's not going to go 50 touchdowns to no interceptions and do all this other stuff. But Joe Montana, for Super Bowl, this is why I still argue that Joe Montana is, I think he is still the good. Like if I had to pick between him and Brady, and I know I'll probably get ripped apart because modern day is who, what have you done now and who, Go watch the film of Joe Montana. Okay, 13 touchdowns, zero interceptions in four Super Bowls. I'll say it again. 13 touchdowns to zero interceptions in four Super Bowls. Right? So, yeah, Brady's awesome, all those things, but, man, 
that's they're both out there. I mean, you put them both, but I could I could easily argue either direction. I just like that Montana has a little cleaner overall image of how right. I did it. All right, good See, question. Man. Thanks for the question, man. Uh, so, coach, let's uh, let's keep the discussion going. Yeah. I know you got a couple more yeah. clips to go. Yeah, in fact, I think I, actually it's just a, just one. We'll talk about some bonus stuff. So let me get this uh, queued up here. All right, here we go. So, and the thing with with him is there's like there's definitely been an evolution over the last couple of years. Oh, there we go. Uh, you good there, Norm? No, we're good. Go for it. All right, all right. Just seeing something a little different on my uh, on my screen on my Zoom with you. Oh, it looks good. You good? Yep, right. full. Got the play. Got okay. you in the corner. As long, as you, say, here, as long good. you say it looks good. As long as you say it looks good. All it looks right, great. sounds good. So here we go. I'm just gonna let it. So you kind of used to it. Blue for people who are new is what happens before the play. All right. So what, what we're gonna have here is let me freeze it back to this spot right here. So what we get there is you get. We we'll get the pause. Yeah, let's just get the pause here. So what happens is you're gonna get motion down. You get play action going back, and this is where the play action goes well. Now, here's the thing. Look closely, Norb, and Super Chat folks, and tell me where Gerald Everett is. Now, Norb, don't answer it. Let everybody else kind of find him. Okay, Norb, where's Gerald Everett? Even though, even though the orange should give it away. <laughs> Um, I was gonna. Nope. I was thinking at first he must be split after seeing that jet sweep play. He must be split to the right from one of those two those two uh, guys up uh, on the right. He's not on the on the end nearest here. Am I wrong that he's one of the so two guys? Color, on remember top? the color key. Remember the remember, remember the color key is blue is motion. orange, yellow yep. is but blue is before the thing. But orange is either either the guy I'm talking about or the person who's connected to the guy I'm talking about. Yellow is everybody else who's eligible to do something. So now there's two guys in orange. There's the quarterback who's going one direction for the play action. And there's one other guy in orange. He's the fullback. So here you have Everett as the fullback. Now, I see this play and I'm like, eh, commercial. And when I say commercial, it's always like you're just doing that and then you're going to motion him out or shift him out, but you're just kind of doing something to, to do it. So let's let's watch and see what you get here. Uh, I got to move forward because there's, there's a little bit. So he's lined up with the fullback. You get the motion beforehand. Boom, jet sweep. Oh, play action. Linebackers bite. And now he's the guy that you're going to out of the backfield. He is the receiver because look how many guys are in the route. Uh, okay. wide open. Oh, again, as you get ready to throw it. But not only is he wide open. And this is where, again, great play fake. Look at the pocket protection mm. because of a great play fake. Three guys bite. They got a linebacker that bit. The other two linebackers bite. They run a receiver deep. Goff is ready to throw the ball right now. This receiver isn't even close to looking back, which tells me that he's not getting the ball. This is a one receiver route because how many other receivers you see down here? <laughs> remember, the, remember the play a few weeks back where, where Russ looked off to the left before he threw the curse to the right? And I was like, who's he looking at? Because, you know, there's no receiver over there to the left. <laughs> right. Well, same thing. But, but what I love about it is Goff gets back, but even Goff doesn't trust himself. Right now, if Goff throws the ball, he's even more wide open, but he hitched, he hitched for just a second versus, hey, seven step as part of the play action, throw it wide open, but out of the backfield. Again, this is what I want to see. So it's not all Carson. It's figuring out how do we maximize a guy who's that hybrid? He's big enough to be a tight end or fullback. And then we get the, you know, as the play goes, I mean, it's just easy toss, easy catch, circle up, yardage down the field. And look right there. Boom. This is what I like at the end of that. I might not be a four, six guy, but instead of running out of bounds or letting you crush me, I'm going to bring it to you. I'm going to bring it to you, little DB, little safety. I'm coming at you and getting another four or five yards versus getting pushed out of bounds. But if you go back to this spot again, right here, play action, pass, boom, play action, quick bite, set. And you can see if he were just thrown on that part right here, and we'll see it better on the end zone because they don't tell straight that part. Just watch it on the golf part, first of all. If he goes right here, and if he just sets right now and just throws it, he's good, but he waits. Mm. He's still wide open. But that this, I think, is what will be the difference between Russ and, and us and why I think, why I do have concerns, which I don't want to talk about, you know, the Rams' new quarterback, who you know I, I'm a big fan of. I think their new quarterback will make that throw even quicker. He'll get back, poop, throw it. Goff... There's a reason why you just got traded to Detroit because you 
kind of stopped doing it there. You just didn't want to evolve. I think Russ will get back there and throw it because he can drop back quicker and he'll throw it quicker. So Russ will do the play action pass quicker and better. He'll be here. And then right now you throw versus waiting, waiting because you throw it before he even looks. And then it's just easy. And I just love how the kid ends the play. And there were so many of those, but I just thought this one, I felt like that one had the best overall. If I was to put everything together that I think he can do, it's, hey, we just signed a tight end. Oh, great. Who? Who did we sign? Norm, are you at a car wash where you could come on and tell everybody we signed a tight end? Okay, yeah, great. You come on. Like, oh, God, we signed a tight end. Okay, now let's look at really what he can bring to the table as the guy who was their second tight end. You know, just because I think he's up a car, I think you'd give him another year. It, it wasn't about him being the second best tight end. It was just more he, he was moved into that U position versus being the true, the more true tight end because he's getting used in the backfield. He's getting used at the Y, but gosh, they're using him in screens. They're using him as play action pass fullback. They're using him in the, on that loop play. Things you just don't see the normal person do. You do see it with a Kittle. You do see it with a Kelsey. You know, you see it with those guys because they're just athletically better. And I think there's just something special about this kid because of the trials and tribulations of what he's gone through as a, as an athlete, I don't know personally what he's gone through, but when you do three schools in five years of college and you're still drafted in the second round by a, a pretty darn good football team, man, that, that says something, something about you must be, must be going right. But something yeah. also must be even better about him wanting to come here versus stay there where he knew he'd be kind of quasi second fiddle getting 60 throws a game, 60 throws per season. That's not too bad as a t- tight end getting 5.2, you know, balls thrown to you a game. And you're coming up here where we threw it twice to tight ends during games under a different regime. Well, that's going to be the big question. So how much different will that be? And it's exciting to see how that's going to translate over. So yeah. I do have so, a question. So I think the big question becomes, Norb. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, this, this might be I think the after. big question becomes, how, how does he... Yeah, you do it. Delays on me. Yeah, no, no. The uh, the go go. <laughs> there is. I I do have a question. Once you're finished with the breakdowns, we still have another play. No, no. I I ended on that one. I, I had an extra one there. Oh, okay. I thought it was a different one. So, so we're you good. know, we yeah, start off the show talking about you know these different who's been in the Super Bowl for the last four years, right? And we've mentioned all these tight ends and and uh, you know. The Rams' last most successful season, obviously, is when they did face the Patriots in the Super Bowl three years ago. And Mm -hmm. under that system was Sean McVay and Shane Waldron and the like. And yet they were they were held to how many points? Single digits? I mean, they were shut down. And and so when we talk about how exciting it is for next year, because we're going to have all those Rams offensive you know styles of West Coast. Why didn't it succeed in the final game? What did the Patriots do to shut down what looks like so, this very innovative, <laughs> hard to stop offense? If Russell Wilson runs it right, it should be unstoppable. But it was stopped. Was it a lack of execution? So, so I want was everybody it to know defense, or was it something that uh, lack of talent in certain areas? I'm just curious. So, it, fair to say that we never really ever talk about what I'm going to do on these shows. For the most part, and we talk about who I'm going to talk about, but not how, what I'm going to bring up, what plays I'm going to choose, any of those things. Fair to say that I have that I have not said what next week's topic is to you. Yeah, I don't have no idea what the next week's topic is. You have no is. idea. <laughs> next next week's topic is New England because I've said it for three of the last four or five shows since the West Coast, but I needed to get through the finishing of the West Coast offense. New England's beating of the Rams and what they did to stop it two years ago and how every team, including the Seahawks implored that defense the following year, every single team came out and ran a defense. They'd never run before new England ran a defense that Belichick had never run before. And it was a defense that stopped the way that new, the, the way that the Rams like to do their blocking scheme. And it kept that you receiver a lot of times now without giving too much away, what the Rams started to do in the running game, because it's all predicated on you still have to establish the run, right? Like, like that's why Pete Carroll wants this and other people. The, the West Coast offense is pass first. It's a pass first offense, but you have to establish the run to make it work, which I know sounds weird, but it's, it's in the writing of you know Bill Walsh's book. Uh, you know, it's all about that. But the defense that they ran was based on the Rams offense was all about running their that you receiver that you tight end 
he was the one who would come across on a on a zone running play. So if the zone running play is going to the right, you'd see the the U receiver come across to the left, and he'd be the guy blocking the backside guy, or he'd be the guy kind of cutting up in there. They, they utilize that guy a ton, and in all other games. He, he could just get these great blocks and the running back would start to run right. And then he'd cut back. And that's what the zone run is. You're, you're kind of running, you're running one direction and you're kind of finding your hole. And then you, you press the hole and read your key and all those things I talked about before to where before it was just pick, you know, you're, you were told what hole to run in. So you'd get all these cutback lanes. Well, the new England Patriots came up with this defense. And, and if you, if you're a fan of this show, I'd highly recommend that you not go try that you not go watch it. Cause I think you'll have a lot of fun watching the breakdown that I'll do. If you want to go find it, go find it. And then you won't, you won't enjoy the show as much next week because you'll kind of already know some of the things. But it, it's unbelievable. And I remember seeing it. I, I didn't figure it out when they first did it. You know, like, gosh, they really crushed him. But then when I watched it, the Super Bowl afterwards, you know, just as a coach wanting to see kind of, gosh, well, how did they really stop him? Man, it was obvious without having it told, like, it, okay, New England's running something I've never seen them run before. And then when you heard Belichick explain it, it's like, man, that's what makes you the greatest coach of all time because he implored something that stopped one thing. He just, he said, I would just want, our goal was to stop one specific thing in their running game. And we knew that that would shut down everything else because it's domino effect. They had to work. They had to establish that zone run, that outside zone run. And if, because they didn't, they couldn't do the bootleg. They couldn't run the zone. They couldn't run the inside track. It, it stopped everything. And then you get out of your, you start to get out of your sorts, right? You just, you're looking on your play sheet. There's no more place to run. You know, and you can't, you can't do stuff. So, but, but the craziest part is when I show you specifically the Seattle Seahawks, how the very first play they come out with when they play the Rams, you, you can literally lay the new England Patriots defense and, or the Seahawks one on top of the other. And we are lined up exactly the same verbatim hmm. <laughs> player for player, spot for spot. It's like, it's the Rams won the, won the exact play. The, the Rams run the exact same first play against us that they ran in the Super Bowl, and we stuff it. And so that's why they went from that to this. So then McVeigh had to go back to the drawing board and, and, you know, figure some things out, which I think is why he's such a genius mind, why they'll turn things around. But it, it is. A, and that's why, no, you nailed it. It's a copycat league. It, you, know, it's, you know, high school, you can get away with running the same offense for 20 years, which is why I changed it every, every year, because I just, I wanted to remember the Titans to always be playing, but I wanted it played over different offenses. <laughs> so, you know, but, but in high school, it's why you see teams run the wing T. They've people have been running the wing T since like 1942. You know, I, I love to change it. College, eh, teams kind of stay with it, but the pros, it, like every seven to 10 years, there's like this new thing that comes and then the defense catch ups, catches up and then the offense evolves then the defense catches up and then it, it just constantly does that, you know, all the time. So the key is I think you have some genius minds. Unfortunately, two of those genius minds are in our, <laughs> in our division and the third one, hopefully, is now our offensive coordinator. And I think the fourth coach is a pretty darn smart guy. He's just decided I'm not going to be another guy also running the West Coast offense. But the thing is, it, it's going to be those defenses that we go against. That, that was what I was going to say earlier is, how do our new guys handle what is the best defensive division also, right? The black and blue, new black and blue division. We have to be okay with... Lord, even though I said I think we can get to the, that 28 to 31 point mark per game, it's gonna. we have to be okay with 8 to 12 play drives. We have to be okay with not scoring on the first drive or not quick scores on the first drive. West Coast offense, first drive, and I'm telling you, like this is a fact from NFL coaches. This is where it's lucky to know a guy like Sherman. Teams don't want to score on the first play of the game. Like They want to go on a 12 to 15 play drive or even go 7 or 8 plays and punt or whatever because of the script because they run their script based on they want to get to the right hash mark and then run a sweep to the left, left hash mark, run a slant to the right, get here do, 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 to see what the defense is running. So in the second quarter, they can make the basic adjustments, halftime, make the two or three major adjustments and go on from there. And you can ask any coach that. So that, that's the fun part of doing these type of things is that stuff. So even though I'm a high school coach, those are the fun tidbits I've been able to pick up hanging out with other dudes that chose to coach a, at a higher level. I just love coaching at the younger level, at the high school level. So one last one last question. I think question. you're gonna love the New England piece. Oh, I can't I can't wait to see um, how they stopped it and, and kind of a, a way to kind of see you know what's the kryptonite to 
to the system that we're going to be running yeah. next next uh, this year. So, so one last thing is, you know, you've talked all about uh, Gerald Everett. What, so, what about the other guys that we've got in there in tight ends? Not including the one that we just signed today, but you know, we got Colby Parkinson and we got uh, Will Disley. What's just your kind of, you don't have to get into super detail, but you know, what's your, what do you feel like is going to be their roles in this? Do you see Gerald Everett's definitely the featured tight end, and the other two guys are, you know, double tight end sets and just. You know, complimentary pieces. How do you think their roles are going to fit with this? Uh, you know, as the trio with Gerald Everett as the number one guy. Yeah, I, I see. What I really hope is that they, that the three of them, are kind of like what we would hope our running back brigade would be, right? Like, like you and I love Carson. Like we're big Carson fans, right? And when we, when I got the text from Sherman, like he loves Carson. <laughs> you know, he's there when he drafted him. Everything else. Like we want Carson to be that featured guy, but we also would agree that. Carson may not be the best guy catching out of the backfield, or he may not be the best guy doing this or like, he's not Marshawn Lynch, right. Who could just, you just kind of knew he could do everything. He could block, he could this, he could that, he could do it. So same thing here. I think Everett's going to be that 70% of the time guy, that, that special chess piece piece that you have. But when you spell him, you're spelling him deliberately. And, and what I mean, or, or maybe the better word is it with intentionality, right? Like you, you're not bringing him out because he's pulling on his chest Jersey. Like, you know, like he taught kids to do because they're tired you're pulling them out because you're putting in another player who's better at whatever that specific play is. Like, I think that that's when coaches evolve into that next level of coaching. You know, when, when I was young, it was like, Oh, a guy's tired or, Hey, we got to sub a guy in at the quarter. You know, like you're telling, telling players do that. And then all of a sudden after a few years, you're like, what am I doing that for? I need to sub guys in to, as, as part of the chess match. So, so you're going to sub guys in. So I think Gerald Everett's going to be the guy that, He's there for the screens. He's there for that. He has to be in there for blocking because you can't be obvious when you take him out. And I think he's good at blocking. But then you bring in a Disley or you bring in other guys, not to just be dummy guys and just or to just block, but because maybe they're better at running a shallow cross or maybe they're better at the delay block to the flat or, you know, the, the one or two things. You know, we talked about last year with um, oh, who was our other time, not Disley. Um, oh, who was the guy? Hollister or Greg Olson? I love my bro- Hollister. That, that's my brain. That yeah, you were always uh, – uh, Praising yeah, Holster him. Loved him because he would do that. That The block that I'm talking about it, with, that the Rams got stuffed. Remember how many times I'd show a play and he was the guy who came around the corner and he'd be the guy coming behind the line of scrimmage and make that kind of outside trap block and we'd run underneath it and stuff. But then he'd hustle down and he'd be the guy high five. And I was like, oh, I hope they just run a play for him where he gets rewarded. And then eventually they did. They, they, but they obviously picked the perfect play that he runs really, really well. I think they'll do that with a Disley and stuff. They'll, they'll say, hey, you keep doing your stuff, work hard, make these guys better, and then we're, we'll reward you by picking and choosing the certain things. I think that's this of all the positions. I think this is the position that they'll do that the most at because Metcalf's obviously going to play. Lockett's going to play. Carson, they're going to do some of that by committee stuff. I think this will be the position where you really see that intentionality. Awesome, man. Well, you know, we had a and the mixture, a, like the jet sweep, yeah. right? The jet sweep. Like at first, when I brought it up to you, I said, "Who do you think is going to run it?" You said what everybody would say: DK Metcalf. It'd be natural to think, okay, a guy who just tried out for the Olympics, he'd be the jet sweep guy. And then I was like, oh, you know what? I think it actually would probably be Lockett because Lockett's smaller. He can. He's probably a little quicker around the quicker, not faster. He's a little quicker, quicker going around on that bubble on the backside after you get the handoff. And then I look here and go, oh, you know what? I'd rather see DK going deep and Lockett going across on a drag and he's doing the jet sweep and he's maybe getting it, maybe not getting it. But when he doesn't get it, he just swings out to the left side and he's floating out there as another outlet guy. And then we've got our running. I mean, geez, Louise, like you got some serious threats that can take place there. And you got a top five quarterback who can master all this stuff. And he doesn't have to sit back there and worry about stuff, but Hey man, just get back there and inside of three seconds, throw it and just get us, keep, keep us rolling, man. Keep us rolling. Cameron Hughes says Hollister was underrated, underrated blocker, just didn't have the strength to break tackles or anything. So that's, hey, he, that's he was my favorite on. player on the team. He was my favorite offensive player last year, without a doubt. I love watching that guy play. Yeah. Well, love hopefully Joel ever can do what he all the things he did and then a little extra more than he did. So well, Coach, you know, we had this sort of unwritten sort of goal to try to stay definitely within Braveheart time and Titanic time. Uh, but you know, yeah. within Star Wars time, and I think you know we we're we're close to staying within the Star Wars time. So, I yeah, mean, at this remember point, the Titans time. We yeah, got to remember, 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 remember the Titans time. So, uh, 
Yeah, that's, appreciate your breakdown, man. This is uh, this is why I love doing Coach's Corner with you, man, because you see those little things that you know most of us probably would watch that, you know, all twenty-two and just kind of go, yeah, yeah, okay, that's pretty good play right there. <laughs> so it's great to see all the the nuances, and I love the graphics and the the additional uh, animations that you've added to it. It's really uh, very cool. Have you stepped up your game? Yeah, they'll keep it. There'll be some fun stuff. I, I've got some. Uh... There's about 10 other things that I've already got going, but I'm just going to slowly bring them in. It, it, it's hard. It's like a kid at Christmas where you get this new thing and you're like, I, I want to show my friends like everything it can do, <laughs> you know, but I feel like eh, it'd be better if I don't show all the little tricks and trade of the telestration, you know, we'll just kind of grow, you know, as you're growing this channel and everything else kind of, kind of fun to do that. But yeah, this is love doing it, man. It, I have a lot of fun. It, it's entertainment. It, it's good stuff. But I think again, the, the 12s are smart people. But I know we've got 12s all over the world, so I hope people that is, as they're watching this, uh, they just see it as a chance to, hey, let's get excited and get hyped up for these guys. And so when people talk about, well, who's that tight end you got? You can now you can say like, oh man, he they line him up as fullback, they line him up as this. Yeah. Hopefully we get that. It's just way better than saying, oh, we got a tight end. What well, what is he like? Well, he's a tight end, right? Like, that's what most <laughs> right. people would say. Not the 12s, man. I think like I'm hyped about us coming back as 12s. Like I think it's going to be at a level we haven't. Oh, I mean, it's just that first, you know, I know that that you mentioned the uh, the Jaguars game. Yeah, that's definitely going to be hype. But the first home game, the first regular season home game, when we all get to be back in there for the first time, man, the talk about a place ready to explode. I cannot wait to see what the energy yeah. is going to be like at that that first game back. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, so, you know, I was thinking, I was thinking, you're mentioning about gotta, how that's why we got to go on a push for. Yeah, we, I was it, just saying we we need to go on a push for for Mama Blue to raise the flag. Mm. In my opinion, it's got to be like a 12, the 12 of all 12s. And with Bill the Beer Man passing, I'd say that she is, you know, her and Mark Collins. And maybe it's a few like, I think we could start that now. Like I get choked. Like, I get choked up thinking about because I hadn't even thought about that till just a few seconds well, ago. Mama Blue actually like, has the raised the flag years. before in the new stadium. She I know did. she has. No, I know but, she has. But it has but, been a while. Paul Allen so it'd be great to NFC, see it again, right? NFC Championship. Yep. So yeah. it'd be great but to see it again. for her to overcome what she's overcoming. Absolutely. And she was the fan of the year. She was a fan of the year last year uh, for yeah. the Seahawks, you know, so I almost won it for the entire NFL. I think NFL. people would go nuts. It would be. So, yeah, especially with what she's done. I, I, I'm well, always ready and to, then, and to then host you film that it. sucker up. i do it. No, because it'd be way better if she's doing it, and all of a sudden you hear this, dun 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 it's remember the titans build up <laughs> yeah that's true the eagle flies in and, and then all of a sudden you put some lightsabers out there so speaking of lightsabers uh I know you don donnie pierce says uh, speaking of star wars i mentioned star wars movie length this morning marked 44 years since what is now a new hope debuted in movie theaters far and near so today and i will never forget because that movie changed my life forever as a third grade what? Kid in elementary school, seeing that movie, oh man, it was uh, it was seriously life. So what if I told you on this day, forty four years ago, on this day, forty four years ago, I literally thought that spaceships were thirty feet over my head <laughs> at the opening of Star Wars in at the old theater in downtown Seattle. That's no longer there anymore. That's where I saw it's, it too. It's all that, and this isn't like a weird. This is like a slam thing of my dad, but it's like it's like the the last memory I have with my dad is going to that. And sitting there in a theater as a as a five year old kid, going, what is like? I don't know what the like. What is a movie theater? I don't know what a movie theater is. I mean, we have a TV at home with foil on the TV. So like, what? I don't know what the difference is. I see, a, and then all of a sudden the lights go out. Okay, it's dark, and that ship comes over the top. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I mean, it just and that was like, what a great way to experience a movie for the first time, but not being scared. Just like, oh my, this is like. I think that's what created that kind of fandom, which we can do on a totally different show, but. I think that's what made the Star Wars nerdism See, this, in all this of This is why because we need to like, do our scary. movie. Yeah. Awesome. This is why we need to do our movie movie night. Movie time. Watching. You know, Star Wars has got to yeah, be one of those. Movie, because movie we could talk a million different things about this, uh, about a movie like that. Because I know that young and old, we've yeah, all and seen to, it. And to clear it up again, Norb, because you, sometimes you say these things, and I think it's because I'm a dad with sensitive ears. Like, I know you were, you're calling the girls big, but when you say let's do a movie night, you're not saying like you and me hanging out together just watching a movie on our own which would be cool like i want oh, to do i'm that. talking about but you're talking like doing a here, reaction with on youtube no, I'm, I'm joking yeah i know <laughs> not that I'm i wouldn't that. enjoy that i, I like I to enjoy said, that like, too hey we need to get together let's watch a movie like yeah i don't know norb like i know we're getting together and stuff but let's yeah, i don't know about that no i'm, I'm joking with you I yeah I, dude i think it'd be awesome I, yeah. i'm all i'm hip for it and we get at least eight to ten people watching 
my family watching us react to whatever. Uh, I think we might get a few Cobra more. Cobra Kai, maybe, Delora, maybe 12. Yeah, there's so movies. much. So much. Yeah, with Remember yeah. the Titans. Great movie. People are talking about, yeah, I love that movie. It's a great movie. Love the music, though. I'll tell but you yeah. what we need to watch. We need to, we need to, we need to watch and react to the Super Bowl that we, that we lost. Because I know oh. you probably haven't, I don't think you've even watched it. Like, we should just uh, oh, watch you mean like the, from the, beginning the, to the, end, the like watch it as a whole game again? No, I have not. I mean, I've watched bits yeah, and pieces. I've had to edit little pieces, so I know certain areas really well. But I've not, as a whole, watched it from start to finish. It's too hard, man. It's so hard I to know. get back into because yeah, it know, brings man. me right back to where I was and the ebbs and flows of that amazing game. But knowing what's coming, it's like you know, I know Luke's going to yeah. get his hand cut off. It's so hard to know that the, all this stuff going through. You're thinking, oh, he's going to have a fight. It's going to be great. It's going to get the best of Darth Vader. But in the end, he's getting his hand cut off. And I don't like watching, but not not if it has a Norb Cam alternate ending. People, I think, would watch. <laughs> if, it's a director's if, cut. If I got to react, if if I got to react to Norb Cam's alternate ending. Oh, you're suggesting together, you're suggesting I make an alternate I'm ending version. I'm suggesting that we watch it. Yeah, that we watch the Super Bowl together, and we kind of go through the emotions. But then, like with two minutes to go in the game, or, or down with at the thirty one yard seconds line, left to go, in like the game. somehow you, you you use your magic, and now like I. I'm not saying focus on me with the reaction, but now it's like how we would react to whatever the new alternate ending is. I think see, there's, there's merit. See, that would have been man. great. You know what? We should have done that. And you shouldn't have told me that because then I would have done it. I would have shocked you. And then you would have had like the true unexpected. Oh my gosh, what happened? But now that you've, Oh, never mind. Huh? We'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll figure out. We'll figure out something. <laughs> but yeah, I had yeah. I had one last thought though because you're talking about. I think they're going to get rid of the word tight end because the tight end does so many different things. Plays out of the backfield, splits out. It's not really the tight end anymore. Yeah. You know what they should call it instead of the tight end. It's simple. They should call it the loose end. And that way, when you're on defense, you say we got to tie it up. Why do we I feel to, like I got to correct you? We got to tie show. up some like, loose ends. Like you're pushing the limits on this show, man. I know. Like, I'm getting I, close I, to Star I know Wars now, saying, but I'll guarantee. It. <laughs> yeah, but I know there's people out there that are like, dude, it's already tough when you called people a tight end forever and people were like, oh, that's like, it was the running joke of so many things. You're like, oh, he's the tight end. He's the tight end. Now you want to call him the loose end and all these other goofy things. You crack me <laughs> up, man. You're so, you're so hip in some ways and you're so naive in others. And that's what makes you like the greatest friend on the planet, man. Cause you're like just a funny dude. Oh, uh, yeah, if I did that and my it. girls were in here and they oh, knew what we were talking about, cause she, they probably wouldn't know the difference between a loose end and tight end. But if they knew what it was and I threw that out, they'd be like, oh, Gosh, dad humor again. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just saying, I think pre based on what, how I know people react. You know to what I'm end, talking about. You're goofy that way. This, I Cameron, don't know what you're talking about. Man. I, you know, says, I'm a grandpa. We should, we should call it the wide end or the move end. Uh, I, I, like, I like loose Easy. ends because then you can always pull that. You know, we got to tighten up some loose ends. We got to tie up some loose ends. Yeah, I, no, I think I think they'll come up with a new name, like in volleyball. Like all of a sudden, there's this thing called a libero. For 847 years. Back to the cavemen and cave women, there was no such thing as a libero, and then all of a sudden there's this new thing called a libero. As the rules kind of changed, but then that like it was fun to watch them because then they got a deal with different colored jersey and and everything else. So, which by the way, I saw that you chose your uh, you chose a jersey number one as the quarterback for face of the franchise or Madden or something like that. Like you're you've already started this start in one jersey, change to another jersey. Not gonna be like, did you get Warren Moon's permission? Oh, to for that one. Well, you know, the, the, it was, uh, I, no, I didn't get Warren Moon's permission. Um, but, you know, it's hard because, you know, you only have so many choices. I, I could have been 12, but I felt like that would have been a disrespect to the fans. I can't take the 12 jersey. That's been retired. But all the other numbers I went through, is I like, just didn't feel right. I saw 17. You can't pick 17. Can't pick 12, yeah, like I said. You can't pick 10. That's Zorn. Can't pick, you know, Russell Wilson already had three. But there are all these numbers. There's nine. I, I think these players who played before, I think John Kitna, I think these other, all these players I couldn't. And then one yeah. was the only one. You I know John Kitna. 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 But Kitna. That, that one just doesn't, you don't normally, it doesn't jump couldn't out take as Rick much. Meyer's number. Yeah, yeah couldn't take those guys' numbers. <laughs> so, anyway, lots of good stuff. But, uh, that is it. So while you are looking at some videos in these top screens and around here that you might want to yeah. watch, yeah. make sure you check out Coach Marsh's YouTube channel, Coach for Life. You can follow him on Twitter as well, Coach for Life. It's Coach for Life 100, but isn't it just Coach for Life? If you look it up, it comes out that way. It's, it's well, there's different things. Yeah, you, you're either going to find me at Coach for Life or Coach for Life 100, depending on which platform you're looking yeah. at. So website is coachforlife100.com, but Coach for Life is the YouTube channel. And Coach for Life 100 is Twitter and all those other fun things. So, there you go. But I just, I'm so, I just appreciate you letting me do this and continuing to, to evolve with you. And I think it's going to get better and better. And, 
you know, there is no, there is no off season. Uh, I think we're just going to keep things going and get these 12s hyped up. And I, I hope everybody out there is super fans and super chat people and everything else. Let's continue to help Nord build this thing. Cause I think there's a lot of cool things that are going to take place moving forward, but he can only do it with your guys' help. So again, as I kind of send myself off, remember, live your life one play at a time and uh, let's get after it 12s. All right. As we look at football and life one frame at a time here on coach's corner y'all be safe talk to y'all later thanks for watching go hawks